So, so I'm delighted to uh, welcome uh, Dan Grosvenor to uh, to this uh, to talk to us uh, about an introduction to our style modelling uh, with UKCA. So thanks, Dan. Dan's at the Met Office and also a CMAC at the University of Leeds. So thanks very much for joining us this morning. Okay, yeah. So, yes, I'm Dan Grosvenor. And like Luke said, I work at the Met Office. Uh, I'm in, within the UK ESM team. So we're developing the next um, UK ESM model, the Earth System client model, UK ESM2. And mainly working on the aerosol composition and, and aerosol cloud interaction uh, side of things. And Amy's just joined the team, actually, Amy Peace, here at the Met Office. Uh, I also work at the University of Leeds for CMAC. Um, so that part of my role there is to help people uh, with things to do with aerosol. So if you have any questions, you can try asking me and I can try and answer them potentially. So a lot of these slides were put together by Kat Scott and Kirsty Pringle and Graham Mann. So many thanks to them and all, thanks to all these other people here. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about aerosols in the UKCA. So first of all, let's just define what an aerosol is. So according to our Good friend Wikipedia, an aerosol is a suspension of fine solid particles or liquid droplets in air or another gas. So here's a kind of conceptual image of aerosols. As so on the left, we have a dry aerosol particle when the relative humidity of the atmosphere is low. And we see we've got a mixture of different substances, and these are all considered solid at this stage. So we have sea salts, ammonium sulfate, or insoluble things like organic substances. And this is the way the UKCA models aerosol essentially is kind of lumping all these different things together in one. <clears throat> it's called an in internally mixed assumption. The alternative is where these are all separate populations of different compositions. So as uh, relative humidity increases to the right here, maybe towards 75 or 80 uh, percent, some some types of aerosol will take on water, and the soluble stuff that was in the solid aerosol will dissolve into that water, giving a solution, whereas the insoluble ones will be left as solid particles within that small droplet, one very small aerosol solution. <clears throat> and then as relative humidity increases further, over 100%, some aerosols can activate into droplets. So that's a very large aerosol. The larger aerosols tend to activate more readily. Um, once they reach a critical threshold size, they tend to take on more and more water become unstable, like an unstable growth regime, and grow into droplets. And they're important for climate effects, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, so just some different sources of aerosols. <clears throat> uh, we've got both natural and anthropogenic sources. So on the top left, we've got volcanoes. Uh, we can get aerosol from sea, sea spray. Uh, aerosols come from deserts and desert storms, and just wind, wind uplift from deserts. We've got biomass burning of trees and grasslands, and we've got industrial processes like burning of coal or industrial um, chimney plumes. Shipping is an important source of aerosol. Indoor cooking, uh, cooking indoors can be an important source of indoor air pollution, and then transport as well. And here are just some electron micrograph, well, electron micro, just kind of electron microscope images of uh, different types of aerosol. Uh, so I've got an animation here, uh, which you might have seen before. It's from the GS5 uh, aerosol model, which is, which is run by NASA. And the different colors here represent different types of aerosol. So white is sulfate aerosol coming from things like uh, burning of coal. Orange is desert dust. Uh, green is biomass burning. And the blue is um, sea salt. So let me play with the pointer here. <laughs> Can't use the pointer. So yeah, so here we can see sulfate aerosol coming from the US, Central Europe, and China, and heading eastwards. And so that's coming from things like burning coal. We can see desert dust coming from the Sahara, heading westwards. And there's a little mini hurricane, or well, hurricanes forming here, one of which goes tracked back towards the UK. So they travel west. Desert dust tends to travel westwards because it's in the trade winds near the equator. And we've got biomass burning aerosol coming from the Amazon and Africa. And the Amazon stuff travels eastwards and 
makes it into the Southern Ocean. And in the Southern Ocean, you can see lots of sea salt aerosol being whipped up by the strong winds there and getting caught in these mid-latitude cyclones and also in the Atlantic. So you can see we've got quite a complex picture of different aerosol sources all interacting with each other, which makes it challenging to model. And you can see this video on YouTube if you like. Uh, so, so why do we want to model aerosol? Well, aerosol has lots of climate effects, which I'll talk about in, in a minute, but it also has uh, chemistry implications. So aerosol can provide a surface area for chemical reactions. Um, and also can interact with biogeochemical uh, living things on, on the earth, things like trees, release aerosol, and also aerosol can provide nutrients for phytoplankton in the oceans, for example. And also has important health effects, can be linked to adverse health effects in humans, cancer and heart disease and various other things. Uh, but let, now let's talk about climate implications. So how can aerosol affect the climate? Well, it can do it in several different ways. One is uh, what we call direct effects, so affecting the relative uh, balance, energy balance of the Earth. So aerosols can scatter and absorb radiation. Um, so here we have an example of aerosols scattering radiation back into space from the sun. So on the left, it's a very polluted day. We don't get much sunlight reaching the surface, so the aerosols are having a cooling effect. On the right, the same city on a clean day, you can see lots of sunlight reaching the surface. So aerosols, aerosols can also affect clouds, which can affect the relative balance of the Earth. So when we have more aerosols, we tend to have more droplets within the cloud. And for, a same, for the same liquid water content, that leads to smaller droplets and a bigger surface area of those droplets, which then makes them more efficient at scattering the, uh, the sunlight back in space, again, cooling the surface. And aerosols can also change cloud coverage and cloud thickness. And we call those adjustment effects. And these, these cloud effects, where we just affect the droplet number, are called the indirect effects or Trumi effect. So here's an example of how important aerosols can be, at least according to client models. So this is from the UK ESM1 client model. And this is for the Atlantic region here, just showing the temperature changes. So between 1850, so pre-industrial times and present day, around 2014. So it's just the temperature perturbation relative to 1850. So the blue line is the full model with all forcings included. And the green line is where we just have greenhouse gas emissions, greenhouse gas forcing. And the gray line at the bottom is with just aerosol forcing. And we can see by 1970, the aerosol one has cooled quite a lot. It's cooled by probably more than the, the warming effect of the greenhouse gases here. So you can see that demonstrates how important aerosols are, at least in this model. After 1970, the aerosol emissions have reduced somewhat in this region, so we start to get warming again. Uh, so here's something from the IPCC. This just demonstrates the what's called the forcing, so the relative impact of different things. And here's the uh, bar for aerosol, so it's negative. That's a cooling effect. Uh, but the uncertainty bar here is very large. Um, this is the bar for greenhouse gases. So you can see that the aerosol cooling is roughly comparable to the greenhouse gases, or especially if we take into account the extremes of the error bar. So this uncertainty is important. We really ideally want to try and reduce that uncertainty, which is one of the reasons why we're, we model aerosols, I guess. Uh, so, building, so modeling aerosols in a global model is challenging. If we want to build a global aerosol model, there are lots of challenges that we face. Uh, it's a very complex system, but we want to, so we want to model that complexity with enough accuracy to do something useful. So the first challenge is that the aerosols cover a large range of scales, size, you know, a big size range. So this diagram demonstrates that. On the right here, we've got a human hair at 50 to 80 microns across. Then we have a beach sand at 90 microns, and then a grain of salt at 60 microns. So the largest aerosols are what's called the coarse mode, and they range in size from about the size of the sea salt, the little grain of salt at 60 microns, all the way down to the size of a bacteria, about one micron. So you can see that's covering a huge range of scales. The next smallest mode is called the accumulation mode, which 
stretches all the way down to the size of the uh, coronavirus, about 0.1 micron or so. And then the acre mode is this next smallest mode, and that goes even smaller. And the nucleation mode is new, kind of new aerosol particles that are formed from the gas phase, and they go all the way down to uh, 3 nanometers, or 0.003 microns. And here's the limits of naked eye visibility, so you can see that they're much smaller than that, the smaller modes. And here are drop hard droplets, ranging from about 2 to 20 microns. So this large range of scales makes it hard to capture in the model. Uh, so here are some size distributions from around the world, demonstrating how aerosol sizes vary uh, between regions. So the, the y-axis here is normalized so that the area under these curves gives the, drop, uh, gives the aerosol number. Uh, so yeah, you just, by eye you can kind of get an idea of the, the total number. Uh, you can see we've got African biomass burning here in Central Europe aerosol, both of the same vertical scale. Uh, so in, in for African biomass burning, we see we've got fresh biomass aerosol and aged biomass aerosol. And the aged aerosol is larger, so it's shifted to the right here. So the numbers are kind of comparable to in Central Europe. In Central Europe, I guess the aerosol is going to be a lot of uh, sulfate from burning of coal and also transport aerosol. And it's kind of similar size to the fresh aerosol and similar numbers. In Africa, dust outflow, the numbers are much smaller, but also extending to much larger sizes. And then in polluted marine environments, the numbers are a lot, even though it's polluted, they're still quite a bit smaller than the uh, European values. And numbers, sizes are similar to, we're similar sizes, I guess, maybe slightly smaller. So it just gives you an idea of how numbers vary and sizes vary around the world. And also things vary seasonally over time. So here is uh, the Arctic. In the summer, we have lots of small particles because we have nucleation of aerosols from the gas phase. And, and compared to winter, we've got large particles. And this is where we get a lot of transport from the mid latitudes. And similarly, for the Amazon rainforest, in the wet season, we have fewer aerosols than in the dry season. Because in the dry season, we have biomass burning. And in the wet season, we also have lots of scavenging of aerosol from the large amounts of rain that happen. So all this makes aerosols quite challenging to, to simulate. So how do we represent these uh, size distributions in the model? Well, there are two, well, a few different ways, but two main ones. One is to use a sectional or bin approach, where we split up the size distribution into lots of small size ranges and carry information about each of those ranges. As you can see, that's going to mean a lot of uh, things to, for the model to simulate, to carry around. So it's quite computationally expensive, but we do, we can get an accurate representation of that size distribution, or of very complex size distributions. A simpler way, which is the way that UKCA does it with GlowMap, is to use log normal modes, which is where we have information just for each, uh, several log interacting log normal modes. So log normal looks like this. And, and the uh, size distribution shapes are just this kind of inverted U shape. And that's obviously, it means we have fewer things to carry around the model, so it's computationally cheaper. And nature does kind of tend to lump things into these different modes anyway, so it's, there is some uh, merit to using this approach because natural processes, processes tend to keep things in certain size modes. But it does mean that we can't catch all the detail of complex distributions. So this is what it might look like in the UKCA, for example. So in the UKCA blowout mode scheme, we can have up to seven modes. We've got the small nucleation mode, and we've got eight can accumulation coarse modes, getting progressively larger. And these three can both have a soluble or insoluble mode. That's with uh, aerosol that dissolves in water or doesn't tend to dissolve in water. And when you add them all together, you might get something like this black line. Um, so one limitation in the UKCA is that the widths of these modes are fixed at the start of the simulation and don't vary very regionally. You can tweak them for each different simulation, but they don't vary uh, from grid point to grid point. Uh, so the next challenge is that particles also vary in composition. We have different types of aerosol. And they all can mix together or not. 
in some cases. <clears throat> so here is just a pie, a different pie chart showing the different compositions around the world, typical compositions. So you can see in the oceans, we have lots of blue, which is sea salt, and also some sulfate and organic. Uh, when we look around the uh, Amazon, we have lots of organic aerosol coming from at least really some trees. Um, over on the west coast of the US, American continent, we have lots, lots and lots of sulfate. And then over by the US, we have quite a lot of sulfate as well, and also a lot of organic. So some of that sulfate might be coming from coal fired power plants, for example. There's lots of variability around the world. But things tend to be dominated by sulfate, um, but, uh, sulfate, sea salt, and organic carbon. Organic matter, as we sometimes call it. We're going to interchangeable terms there, organic carbon and organic matter. So within globe map mode, where we've got these log normal size distributions, within each of these modes, uh, the composition is the same. So so no matter so the aerosol can vary in size within the mode, but composition stays the same. <clears throat> That's known as an internally mixed assumption. Uh, also, so I guess, yeah, that, that is, does, in nature, that's not always the case because we can imagine, say, one air mass of lots of sulfate aerosol, one air mass with lots of organic carbon aerosol. And if they come together, in reality, those two air masses, those two aerosol populations would stay quite separate. But in the UKCA blow map, they would be instantly mixed together to form this internal mixture. That's a bit of a, uh, an assumption there. It's not always a good assumption. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's a limitation. And also we cannot account for varying composition with size. But each mode does have a different, kind of different composition. So we can do something, can, we can account for that in some way. Uh, also each, each mode has several different mass values for each different composition, only one number concentration. So if we want the number concentration of a, of a particular species, then that's just done by uh, based on the mass fraction. So if it's 25% sulfate by mass within a mode, we assume that there's 25% of the number of that mode is, is uh, sulfate as well. So these are the different species that are available in the UKCA or Clomont mode. Uh, the standard setup, well, I don't know if there's such things as standard setup, but the one that we use for the U UK ESM, and the one that tends to get coupled with the UN is with four chemical species and five modes. So those four chemical species are sulfate aerosol, organic matter, organic carbon, black carbon, and sea salt. And these are the five modes. We've got nucleation soluble, aqueous soluble, accumulation soluble, coarse soluble, and aqueous insoluble. And we can see that within those modes, these are the species that are allowed. So in some modes, certain species aren't allowed. So sea salt is only allowed in the larger modes, the accumulation in the coarse modes, and only in the soluble modes, so it's, highly, it's highly soluble. Similarly, sulfate is only allowed in the soluble modes. Organic matter can go in all, all the modes, really. Um, and then in the in the UK, in Globat mode, there's also the option to use a dust scheme, UKCA modal dust. So when we use that, we have these two extra modes. So two large modes with insoluble aerosol. We've only just allowed in those two modes. So currently in the UK ESM, for example, dust is treated, treated separately outside of BIOMAP, so we don't have these two. Uh, but the next version will probably use uh, global, global modal dust. We're moving towards using that soon, I think. And there's also what, an option to use what's called a nitrate scheme. So nitrate aerosol has not been in the model for a while, but it's been recently put in. And it's quite important. And that gives you these three different extra species, ammonium, nitrate, and sodium nitrate, which can then go into these modes here. So we don't have any extra modes for that scheme. And so that's, that also will probably go into the UK ESM in the next version. Uh, yeah, so the next challenge is that we have lots of different processes going on, uh, which change the size distribution and the chemical composition of aerosols. I'll go over some of those. So I guess where it all starts is with emission. So we call this primary emission. 
And this can be emission of either precursor gases that then go on to form aerosols, or the emission of aerosols directly from cells from the surface, so solid aerosol particles from the surface. And these could be examples of these could be black carbon from wildfires, or organic carbon or sea salt coming from sea spray, and also dust from the deserts. Uh, in terms of gas phase emissions, these are generally done, a lot of these are done by um, offline ancillary files. So just predetermined, predetermined before the model simulation. So things like DMS and SO2, sulfur dioxide, coming from natural anthropogenic sources, uh, are emitted in ancillary files. Uh, and so for SO2, a fraction of the SO2 gas that's emitted is assumed to be particulate already. And that's to account for subgrid nucleation of aerosols. So sub subgrid formation of solid aerosol particles in the gas phase, uh, which we can't model. So we assume a certain fraction is already, is already uh, aerosol. We've also got things like BVOCs, which are biogenic volatile organic carbon, mostly released from trees. These can be either offline or in the UK ESM, they're interactive. So we have they, they're uh, calculated as a, as a function of how many trees we've got and temperature conditions, for example. Um, yeah, things like black and organic carbon, they're emitted into the Aitken mode. Um, and where we emit these things, we, the size that we emit them to is, can be quite important. The results are quite sensitive to that. And they come from things like biofuel, fossil fuel, and biomass burning. And then, yeah, this is how, uh, this is how the offline emissions are developed. So I won't go into that here, I don't think. Um, so other types of emissions are interactive emissions. So this is where we calculate them based on uh, model variables, which can evolve over time. So sea spray, for example, is calculated as a function of wind speed. And that's emitted into the larger sizes, accumulation of course modes. Mineral dust is also dependent on wind speed and soil moisture and land type. And Stephanie Woodward in the UK ESM team is working on that. And like I said earlier, dust is often there's a separate dust scheme that can be used, which is a six-pin scheme, which doesn't interact with the other aerosol. Or you can do it inside the UKCA in the UKCA model dust scheme. Uh, so bi biogenic volatile organic carbons, like I said, can also be used in an online mode, uh, and then, re then they respond to temperature and tree cover. So the next stage after we've emitted precursor gases or directly emitted aerosol, well, especially in terms of precursor gases, is the formation of aerosols from those gases, which is called nucleation. Uh, so here's an example of nucleation happening from some observations. So this is time, and this is size of aerosol. And the colors are the number of aerosol within, within, within a given size range. So if we take a slice each time, that's essentially, essentially like the size distributions I've shown earlier. So you can see at the start, we had lots of aerosol at about 20 nanometers. That's where the mode is. Uh, but then suddenly at 12 hours, we get lots of small aerosol appears, about three nanometers or so. And that's a nucleation event where we're getting lots of aer small aerosols appearing from the gas phase and then they gradually grow over time. So that can happen in two different ways in the model. We've got the sulfur species, so that's sulfur dioxide and DMS from the oceans or sometimes from the trees. And then that needs to be oxid oxidized first chemically in the atmosphere to uh, sulfuric acid gas. And then that can go on to form or nucleate solid sulfuric acid aerosol particles. Another way is via, via the BVOCs or biogenic volatile organic carbons. And again, they need to be oxidized into this time into something called SOA or secondary organic aerosol, which is a gas again. And then that can nucleate organic matter or organic carbon aerosol. And that, al but that also needs the input from some sulfuric, that also needs some sulfuric acid, acid gas to work. And that's done by the Metzger scheme. Um, so in the upper troposphere, we have very cold conditions and also very clean conditions, which are ideal for nucleating new aerosol particles. 
Uh, because if we've got any pre-existing aerosols, then that tends to steal the vapor and prevent mutilation. So that's mainly happens by sulfuric acid, and the Vecumaki and Kamala schemes are available in the model, I think, or at least uh, two examples of the way it can be done. Further down, uh, lower down in the atmosphere, in the boundary layer, things are much more polluted and warmer, which tends to inhibit mutilation. Um, but we can get mutilation happening via um, biogenic volatile organic carbons, and also ammonia is thought to be involved, but that's currently not in the model. So the main scheme for doing that in the model is the Metzger scheme. That's the one we're testing for the next UK ESM iteration. That's the one I mentioned down here. So yes, that's nucleations. That's how we get new particles into the atmosphere, which is very important. The next stage is then we've got those lots of small particles. They can then condense, uh, they can then coagulate together or join together. Also, they can grow via condensation of gases onto those particles. And only 10% of those nearly formed particles make it up to the larger sizes of 100 nanometer, where they might start making cloud droplets, for example. So condensation is where gases, low volatility gases, uh, condense onto pre-existing aerosols. So that grows the aerosols, but doesn't change their size. Uh, so as we grow aerosols in UKCA, um, the modes can grow in size, and sometimes if they reach too large a size, then some of that aerosol gets passed upwards into the next size mode up, so we can get transfer between modes in the UKCA and glow up. Uh, so condensational growth can change the aerosol composition, and it can also move aerosol from the insoluble to the soluble distributions. So for example here, we might have some organic matter aerosol, kind of carbon, and then, but then we've got condensation of sulfuric acid onto that uh, aerosol. So sulfuric acid, sulfuric acid aerosol is soluble. And so if we get, have enough of that happening, we can transfer this from the insoluble mode to a soluble mode. So that's a process that's in, in the model. And that could be important for making um, certain aerosol. Be, so they can only act, act to form droplets when they're in the soluble mode. So, so that can be important. Coagulation is when droplets combine, oh, sorry, aerosols combine together. Uh, so again, we're forming fewer large aerosols, uh, and this mainly occurs due to Brownian motion, which is when the aerosols are being uh, impacted on by air molecules, so getting jiggled around by the air molecules, which makes them stick together to other aerosol molecules and make larger ones. And that's particularly important, particularly efficient, when we have lots of large numbers of small aerosols, for example, in a fresh bloom from a power plant. Um, the coagulation can occur within a size mode, but also between modes, and that way we can change the composition again because we're mixing between different uh, modes. And also, again, it can move from the insoluble to the soluble distributions. And finally, we, we can also have aerosol processes happening within cloud, which is again in the climate model. For example, <clears throat> Uh, aerosols that form clouds in, uh, inside the cloud droplets. Uh, because we've got aerosols inside the cloud droplets, but then those cloud droplets can also uh, have things like sulfur dioxide dissolving in them. So sulfur dioxide is quite soluble into liquid water. So if we've got, so if more sulfur dioxide dissolves into the cloud droplet and forms uh, sulfuric acid, then that can then increase the size of the aerosol or the amount of sulfur dioxide in that droplet. And when that droplet evaporates, we end up with a bigger aerosol droplet, aerosol particle. And that's often what's caused, what causes these uh, bimodal size distributions in marine areas, for example. So it's in cloud processing of aerosol, you can grow aerosol inside clouds due to gases dissolving into the droplets. That's also in the model and also quite important. Um, so we talked about aerosol formation and aerosol chain, things that evolve the aerosol size distribution, but we should also talk about removal. So there are several different ways to remove aerosol in the model. One is dry deposition, and that's where the aerosol just impacts onto the surface of the ocean or the, the land. And it's dependent on the surface type and the particle size. Aerosol also settles with gravity, so that removes aerosol from one model level to the next level down. 
Uh, although the aerosol is only completely removed when it gets to the, the lowest model level near the surface. And also clouds, well, raining clouds also remove a lot of aerosol. So within a cloud, if aerosol has formed a cloud droplet, and those droplets coagulate to form lots of larger droplets, which eventually form rain droplets, um, then that coagulation will lead to, uh, well, it can remove aerosol directly from the rain, but also if the cloud evaporates again before the rain falls out, then the combined, lots of aerosols are combined into one to form fewer aerosol. So we end up with a bigger aerosol uh, particle than we had before. And also we get direct removal of aerosols below clouds by impaction from the rain falling through and just uh, swallowing, the, swallowing the aerosol below the clouds and taking it to the surface. And that's removed. So those are the main removal processes in the model. Uh, this is just a, a rundown of the um, <clears throat> The different processes and the order that are called in the model. So we have the emission of gases first, and then the chemistry, and then the aerosol routines, which are broken up into these several steps. So all, these are all these different processes that I've talked about. Um, the primary emission, oxidation, uh, changing the aerosol modes, which is the V mode where we move aerosols from one mode to another. Coagulation, aging, which is the moving of aerosol from the soluble to in, from the insoluble to the soluble modes. And then finally at the bottom, we have activation, which is where the aerosols may potentially activate into cloud droplets. So a brief word on that. So the model uses what's called the activate scheme, which was developed by Rosalind West and Philip Steer. Uh, so this calculates the number of droplets at cloud base, based on the size of the aerosol, composition and the updraft speed. So with size generally thought to be the most important. So large aerosols tend to form uh, droplets more readily. <clears throat> also, composition is important because generally only soluble aerosols will form uh, droplets. So we form, we calculate the number of droplets at cloud base, and then they're replicated vertically throughout cloud layers. So it's just using the same number replicated vertically per kilogram of air. And we do this because UKSA doesn't have a um, tracer for droplet number. It just, re it just recalculates the droplet number every time step, which could be important. Whereas something like the Kazim microphysics model does have a tracer for droplet number. So it's a bit different. And then another important thing to consider is the, I guess, the direct effects or the radius effects of the aerosols uh, outside of clouds. And that's done by the Rad Air scheme which calculates the optical properties, such as scattering and absorption. And so that's it really as for, my, for what I wanted to talk about. So I'll just conclude by saying that, the, like we said, the UKCA mode is a global aerosol model, and the size distributions are represented by lots of different uh, log normal modes. We normally use five, at least for the UK ESM, but we can use up to seven. Um, we use, we treat four different species, sulfate black carbon, organic carbon, or often called organic matter, and sea spray or sea salt. Uh, we can also use dust within UKCA mode, but in the UKASM that's used, dust is treated separately in a different scheme with no interaction with glow map. And there's also the option to use a nitrate scheme, which we will be using in UKASM soon. Oh, we already got it switched on for the next prototype, actually. And that also gives you these extra species, ammonium nitrate and sodium nitrate. Uh, so you can change or mess around with these modes, have more or fewer modes for different species. There's a few different preset ones that you can use that are already set up. To set up your own will be quite challenging, but I think there's probably enough in there to already use a preset one. Uh, we treat lots of different aerosol microphysical processes that control the size distribution. So I talked about emission, mutilation of new particles, combining of particles through coagulation, and the condensation of gas onto particles, and also processing that happens within cloud droplets, and also removal processes. processes again, sometimes involving clouds and rain. Also, just dry deposition onto the surface is an important removal process. And then, yeah, this is all coupled to other parts of the model, for example, the activate scheme. 
and the chemistry scheme. Um, the model is still in development in some ways. We're still finding, adding new things to it, still finding bugs. But in general, it does compare quite well to observation. And there's lots of papers documenting that. So here's just some uh, useful references for further reading. The gray man did a lot of the work on global mode, and he's got a paper here describing a lot of those processes that I talked about and how they're treated in the model. And then there's a model, a paper by Jane Mulcahy, who's the leader of the UK ESM team here at the Met Office. Uh, so she's yeah, she describes how things are different in the UK ESM and also does a lot of, a lot of evaluation. And it's Ken Causal's textbook is very useful in general for aerosols and climate work. And then finally is the UM documentation. So if you go to this link here and look for document number 84, then that's the one for the UKCA chemistry scheme and the GLOMAP aerosol scheme. And that has a lot of useful information and talks about how these things are done. A lot of the, how a lot of these processes that I talked about are done in the model. It doesn't have everything in there actually. So I think for, so for some of the processes, you might need to go directly to the code because some of them haven't really been that well documented, I would imagine. Some of the more detailed ones, for example, coagulation. I don't know if there's any information on coagulation in there. So, so one option is to always look at the aerosol, the GLOMAP code or the UKCA UM code. Obviously, that's a bit more in depth and challenging. So, yeah, so I'll leave it there. And uh, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks, Dan. That's great. Um, are there any questions for Dan? Maria Paula? Yes. Hello. Hello, Dan. Thank you for the presentation. It really resolved a lot of those but also create some. <laughs> then mm -hmm. I wonder when we add an emission, should we also add the composition and the size distribution or how is the advice way to add an emission that emit aerosols? I guess if it's a new, a new species, then yeah, you'd be, have to go through quite a lot of work to Add that in the model, really. Um, yeah, it's, it's probably. I guess it's possible, but I think it would be quite a lot of work. So what, what kind of emission were you were you thinking? For example, biomass burning, because I'm I'm thinking in the two possibilities. Using, for example, an inventory that have like the amount of aerosols, but the aerosols are normally like divided in blood carbon and organic matter. But then maybe it will use two of the composition that you show. And also there are the way that is with Inferno, but I'm not sure how Inferno works with aerosols. The Inferno is like the model for uh, fire emissions in the unified model. Yes, yeah, so we do have emissions you know, from, from biomass burning of black carbon and organic carbon already. And yeah, there's quite a lot of work going on with the inferno scheme um so i'm not yeah i'm not sure if there's something missing potentially i guess potentially but so amy peace here is actually working on that looking at inferno as part of the uk esm team and there's quite a few people working on it but yeah i don't know much of detail i don't know a lot of details about whether there's something missing or a particular aerosol emission that's missing but i think if you did want to add a new species that would be quite a lot of work i'd imagine uh, <laughs> look is there anyone ever there? I, I always advise one of the best things to start with is to look at how it's done already for an existing species and understand how that works. Um, so that'll give you an idea as to what the steps would need to be done for adding in something new. Um, because there's an example that's there. Um, that's that's generally how I've looked at it. There is there is some coupling with Inferno. Um, I'm not sure how well that's been tested. Um, so Amy might be able to comment more on that. Um, maybe not now, but but in the after she's worked on it a bit. But um, yeah, it's there's certainly emissions as you you're seeing for just for chemistry is quite complicated. But as as um, aerosols might will be different again. 
So that's been done before. I guess we, recently the nitrate scheme was added, which involved adding new aerosol species. So that was a work done by Anthony Jones. And yeah, there has been some testing of Inferno. So Joao Tichero has been doing a lot of work. So he's got some papers out on that. So you might want to read those. And then, yeah, Amy will be testing it in terms of the UK ESM. So I think there will be some new work on that. So that'll be quite, quite good to collaborate, I think. Perfect. Thank you. That's great. Any other questions? Dan, I was, I mean, I was interested in your point at the end, I mean, about the documentation. Um, mm. Sounds like really we need to do a bit of a refresh on that because um, it should all be in there. Um, yeah. So we might have to have a think what's, as you say, what's missing and, and put some documentation in for it. Um, yeah, it's yeah. not the, the easiest of documentation papers to read. Uh, but it should, it, it, you know, because it's it's got everything, but it's a bit dry. But it certainly should cover all the options that are available. Um, yeah, it might cover all the options. It, it doesn't always explain how everything's done. So I was, I was trying to find out some things for this talk. I couldn't quite find out everything I wanted. I had to look at the code for some things. But, okay. Yeah, but yeah. I think mean, maybe some of the older glow map stuff is not in there. I, th I think possibly so because the, they've gotten a lot better about documentation papers recently in terms of, you know, every change must have documentation done for it sufficiently, but obviously it was a bit lax in the past and Glomap has been in the model for quite a while, um, like version 6.3 or something, 6.6, .6, I think it first went in mm. potentially. So, you know, that's, that's a long time ago now. Um, you know, it was, you know, prior to Graham's 2010 paper. So certainly they've improved the coding requirements to make things clearer for people uh, since then. Yeah, yeah. So whether it's all in Graham's paper or maybe some separate climate documentation. 